Welcome. You're listening to Living Faith Podcast. Starry sky, see your hand in time, in mind to lead me through the night. Today, if you'll allow me not to overcomplicate the word, I simply want to preach and communicate to you on a subject that I've just entitled time. Time. And that's a very fragile subject to a preacher that understands there's a clock behind him. And so I get exactly what I'm doing to myself. Amen. Would you go as we have so many times before the Lord and ask him to bless the word of the Lord. Jesus, your word is anointed. The promise within the scriptures is that it will not return void. And I believe in the power of the word. I believe, God, that as you woke me early this morning, you placed a word in my spirit for this congregation, for this moment in time. And I pray, God, that this vessel of clay will communicate to the best of its ability. Pray, God, that every word that goes forth, let it be communicated and be planted into some fertile soil that it may spring forth, God, in its time, some 30, 60, and some 100 fold. We believe in you, Jesus, and what you're going to do. Everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing. Amen. One woman stated these words. She simply said, adding wings to the caterpillar does not create a butterfly. It creates awkward and a, dis- a dysfunctional caterpillar, rather. Butterflies are created through the process of transformation. About a year ago, a little over a year ago, um, I was privileged to have my right knee totally reconstructed. And what a privilege that is. If you haven't experienced that, take it up. It's like a seasonal recreational holiday kind of thing. And uh, worst pain I've ever experienced in my life. Um, I didn't realize how difficult it was going to be. They didn't realize how bad my knee was. Um, Turns out that I had a torn ACL. It was holding on by a few threads, but it was shredded nonetheless. And um, all in the name of fitness, right? All in the name of being healthy. And so imagine the contradiction there as I laid there um, in the recovery room. And um, they begin to tell a very dysfunctional mind, very uh, heavily medicated mind, exactly what they had done. And they fixed two major meniscus tears and an ACL tear and uh, drilled through the bone. If, if you're not into that kind of thing, you know, I apologize. But <laughs> the truth of the matter is they just took care of it. They pushed it right through two of your bones and they tied the... Uh, the new uh, cadaver in there. And so um, they told me they, um, they went ahead and put a, a younger man's ACL in there. So I brought my median age down a little bit, thankful for that. <laughs> and, um, but but it was the, the, the process of all of this together, and they found out that my kneecap actually slipped to the side, which was probably the most major of all of the complications there. So they had to go in, clip the muscle, tie the muscle, shave down cartilage. It was just a massive ordeal. And I thought maybe just ACL and I'll be up and around in six to eight weeks. And it turns out that I'm still affected. My knee still swells up at the end of the day and still goes down. And it is, it's just, it was an undertaking. I tell you, I, I didn't walk for almost nine weeks and, um, I had mentioned that fitness is a big part of the way that I mentally stay healthy. And so the vocation that God has got me in, I've traded up, by the way. I'm so thankful for it. But it can be heavy at times. And so I have fortified my mind by going to uh, the gym every day, every day but Sunday. And I take an hour vacation every day. And that is my own time, that the only people that I let into that time are my personal family. And so that's a way that I can keep myself going. And it's in my business, in our business, time is where you see progress. Six months, six years, 16 years. 
um, is where you see progress. And so seeing immediate results sometimes is very beneficial. And so I don't mind painting a wall. I don't mind cutting the grass because it, there is conclusion to that. I can walk away with that and say, wow, a job well done. I've done something. And so um, I, I sat there upon hearing the report and the first 10 days were excruciating. And I went back and the medicine didn't work and so I was just a, I was a pill. They were shoving all kinds of medication down. I was, I'm illegal, I promise you. I don't know what I was taking, but I am not legal right now. And they were throwing things down the hatch just to try to get me to cope. And so I went back and when they did the assessment, I, I'm on a machine. Have anybody ever been forced to be in a machine called a CPM machine? Fantastic. <laughs> if you are ever in a machine, they put you in it almost immediately. And um, it's a machine that literally forces your movement, pushes you for you. And it's for the purpose of ensuring that your muscles don't settle. You can have flexibility the whole nine yards. You can imagine what it's for. And so they bring it to your house and hand it to you, and you're still on medication. And so you have to have somebody there that's taking care of business. And so my wife is hearing, and they say they want 30% or 30 degrees, rather, the, um, the second day. So get in it, and the second day they want 30 degrees of flexibility. And so I made up in my mind, I couldn't be at the gym, couldn't lift, but everything is a process and everything has the opportunity to be some form of competition. So I myself decided that I was going to beat the system. And so by the time I reached my 10 day checkup, I was finally over the major hump of pain and I was so excited to sit on the table, Brother Miller, and as I sat on the table, she said, how is the CPM going? I said, it's fantastic. She said, really? I said, absolutely. She said, well, you should be at somewhere around 65 to 85 percent. I said, I'm at 120 degrees. She said, really? I said, yeah, I'm at 120. She said, that's fantastic. And uh, she said, do me a favor, take your brace off. So I took my brace off and, and she said, show me. I said, you want me to show you right now? She said, yeah, show me. Show me 120 degrees. This is 10 days. And when I begin to try to move my leg, it didn't go 30 to 40 degrees. I was willing it to go. I was pressing everything that I had. Every, every neuron was firing down to that area, but there was nothing, no response. And my knee would only do 30 to 40 degree bend. And I sat there sweating and in frustration, Brother Drew, because I had worked so hard in order to, to get to the progress. And she said, Baron, there is a great difference and I won't forget the way she said these words. She said, there's a great difference in being forced to do something and being able to do something. She said, the machine forces you to do it. Your inability is because of that trauma that was there. And I learned something that day that began to stick with me about the concept of time and the importance of time. I'm going to go back to the knee injury. My wife's not here. This is live. Yeah. I saw it. I saw it in the back. Saw it. She does not allow me to talk about my knee injury, by the way. Um, you can ask her about that. She does not allow me to talk about my knee injury because I had like four or five great messages. And so she said, Baron, it's enough. Uh, it's enough. So when she's not here, she's two hours away. What's she going to do? Um, I'm sorry, babe, if you watch this later. But I'm going to go back to that and you'll allow me to come into the verse of scripture that I feel like the Holy Ghost woke me up very early this morning. I had a lot of trouble uh, sleeping in the early morning, and I just finally I got out of bed around 4.30, and I went and sat at the desk, and, and um, I just began to write. And so it's going to seem like there's uh, a hodgepodge here, but I think it, it meshes together right. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Perhaps this is a scripture or a passage that you have read or heard of many times. It is a very notable passage of scripture, and it simply says these words, To everything there is a season 
and a time to every purpose under heaven. It's interesting to me that the next seven verses, the preacher contrasts between how life oscillates between between what may be good or what may be bad, what may be a time for growth and what may be a time for death. And he's, he's swinging the door, if you would, back and forth. Each swing of life hinges on a frame, and that frame is called time. For instance, there is no yelling at the weather if there is snow drifting up on the porch in the mist of January. But we would be perturbed if we would step out in the month of July and there would be a foot of snow on the ground. It's not the time for that. It's, it's a very different timing. And so the, 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 uh, the author here, the, the preacher here, if you would, is simply saying the door of life swings. It swings both ways. There is a time for life, and then there is a time for death. There is a time for love, and there is a time for hate. And everything hinges on the framework of time. It's not that death itself, it's the time of death. It's the time of death. The difficulty of losing a grandmother who is 95, 96 years old, the memories that are made. But the untimely death of a child who has yet to be born and so, so filled with expectation. One of my closest friends in the entire world called me this, well, texted me this morning and said, please pray. A man in his church, a, a, a minister in his congregation, a district official in the state of Nebraska, adopted some children and I don't know the whole story, but the, the truth of the matter is, is the, uh, the oldest boy that they adopted, they, they lost him last night. He drowned. They can't find his body. It's, it's, it's the time. It's that time not only of death, it's the time now of dealing with death. I buried one of uh, a man who used to attend our church, and, and not only attend our church, was very active in our church. Not only very active in our church, he was on our staff. I buried him uh, just a, a matter of a few weeks ago, and um, a young man, 41 years old, and, 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 and so full of life and potential. And, and we're not talking about somebody that was living underneath the, the bridge. Not that, that You get what I'm saying? I don't have to validate that. I'm talking about somebody that seemed like was on top of the game in fact, that day he's supposed to sign a contract uh, uh, to purchase a company. He's, he's worth millions and millions of dollars, and, and they lost him. They can't find him. They found his vehicle. They found his, his smartwatch there, and they can't find him. Five days later, his body uh, emerges from, uh, from, from, the, from the depths of the river, and it's floating up against a low-water dam, and they pulled him from He's got four kids, and, and he's gone. No explanation. A simple note on Facebook. The time now of dealing with that is terrible. Time is such an interesting concept. I don't have time to go into the aspects of time. But, but what I felt this morning, very early this morning, was at the conclusion of these verses that the preacher introduces to us, he summarizes it with two verses in verse number 10 and verse number 11. He says, I've seen the travail. We can call it the various employments those weights of life which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in. I've seen the travail. I've seen the difficulty of life. God is allowed, if you would. God has given. He's offered. We understand the perspective of what Solomon is talking about throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. He seems like he's in both a frustrated state of mind as well as a great state of mind. He just, he's teetering back and forth. Everything is vanity. Every, every, everything under the sun. It's, it's like he's at the end of his life looking back. And when he's looking back now, he's saying to himself, I, I can evaluate time. And over the course of evaluation, here's what I've summed up. I have seen the travail and God has exercised men in it. But he doesn't stop there because God is not just somebody that exercises men in the duties of life. Solomon goes on to say, as if he could put a however on verse number 11. 
And he says, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. In its time. You read on in the book of Ecclesiastes and you pick it up back in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And it's as if he's reintroducing the concept of chapter 3. And here's what he says. He who keeps his commands will experience nothing harmful. And he goes on to say, And a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Because for every matter there is a time and a judgment. Though the misery of man is greatly increased or is heavily upon him. One of the darkest moments in my life a few years ago probably five or six years ago, questioning all kinds of things. Never marriage, never relationship with God, never the truth, but just questioning life. I called a, a mentor. Uh, uh, Brother Miller would know who I was talking about, but I called this mentor in my life. I said, this is where I'm at. This is what's going on. I, 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 need, I need perspective. I need help. I need somebody to iron out some things in my life, and I need somebody who has lived some life, who has experienced some time to be able to help me out with this. He said, can I take your attention? Eventually, he said, can I take your attention to Ecclesiastes? And we turned there together, and we wept at this verse, this passage of Scripture, Ecclesiastes 8. He said, bear and understand one thing. God's divine purpose unfolds both with time and with judgment. He said, let me break this down for you. He said, God reveals, most often, God reveals His judgment, His decision, well before the in intersection, if you would, of the time that it will unfold. God gives the promise. He gives the revelation. He gives the dream. He, he, he shares with you that, that, that assurance that somewhere in the future, X, Y, and Z is going to take place. The issue is, is the distance between when the promise was given and the time that it unfolds. And it's the misery of the time until the promise unfolds. It's time. Time brings great misery. I could take your attention to many examples in the word of the Lord. Perhaps the most fitting would be the Old Testament example of Joseph. When Joseph is... Coming forth from sleep and the vision, the dream that God gives to him. And he gives in, in portraits. It's not in, in a video format from very beginning to very end. He gets snapshots and he walks out. And he's already got an abrasive relationship with his brothers. He's wearing a coat. He, he's daddy's favorite. We understand. Can I say this? It's not Joseph's fault that he was his father's favorite. It's not Joseph's fault, but he doesn't help himself when he comes out and says, check this out, gentlemen. One of these days, I see you guys bowing down before me. One of these days, I see your stars bowing down. I see the sun and the moon bowing down. I see the stocks bowing down. And he's, and he's, uh, he's uh, uh, going through the, the, the concept of the two dreams. And, 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 and the, the gentlemen are saying, this is the final straw. He's not going to disrespect us or our father, or our parents. And so they devise a plan. They devise a plan. And the plan was, you know how it unfolds. A plan began in the pit, ends up in Potiphar's house, ends up in the prison, stays in the prison for two years. He goes from the prison to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh into his own home. There's many levels in the life of Joseph, I promise you. There's many levels. But it looks like it's levels in reverse until he steps foot in Pharaoh's house and he says, dreams belong to God. Tell me what the dream is. And, and, and he unfolds the plan of action. He's smart. He's learned over time. And he says, you need to choose a man who both understands and knows how to discern, who is able to, to, to capture the, the, the coming, uh, the harvest that's coming and to, to prepare for the famine. And, and Joseph, uh, and Pharaoh looks down at Joseph and says, is there any other man that would be able to do it but this one? Joseph 
is now standing in a place, but the dream has yet to be fulfilled. It's not in the successful moment of Joseph's life that the dream is going to unfold. It happens in the house. The dream happened in the house. It unfolds in a house. It happens in daddy's house. It unfolds in his own house. Joseph's a different man. He's so different that they don't recognize him because of time. There's a lot of time that has passed. There's a lot of water that's crossed underneath the bridge. And now Joseph stands before his brethren. And Joseph is able to say, now listen, don't be upset with yourselves. I'm not upset with you. You thought you were sending me. Or you thought you were selling me rather. But it was God who had sent me. So the whole thing it, it, it uh, uh, forces itself back into the fact that, that there was something that needed to take place. You were just tools in the hand of the Lord. So don't be upset with yourself all of the, all of the time. But we can look at Joseph's life, and, and here's what we have, to, uh, we have to base all of this off, off of. Joseph's 110 years old when he dies. 110 years old. He lives to 110. Somewhere around 17-ish when he leaves. Somewhere around 30-ish when his brothers come in. 10% of his life is in transition. But the majority of the scriptures written about him are through that transition. Why? Because man's misery is greatly upon him. The time that you embrace, the time that you have to deal with it, the time that you're going through it, the time that you have to stay faithful, the time that you have to, you have to uh, summon up inside of yourself and say, I'm, I'm not going to deviate from what I know. I'm not going to deviate from who I am. No matter what. I don't care how customary it is. Come on, Joseph. Come on, baby. I want you. It doesn't matter how much you want. I can't violate the man of the house, and I can't violate the principles that were, that were poured into me. But you don't live in, 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 in your father's house anymore. This is a new season. Yeah, but, but you don't understand. I can't violate. And, and that's what God is trying to, to, to unfold in the story of Joseph. He wants to unfold the pages of Joseph's life and to dictate to us as the reader thousands of years later in that time frame Joseph remains faithful to God he remains faithful to God it's time ladies and gentlemen time I looked into the face of the doctor as she began to to look over my my knee it's not not ten days now we're, we're eight or nine weeks later. The decision is being made whether or not I can put, finally put pressure on my leg. And she looks at it and I look at it. My leg has gone from, there's no muscle. It's just, there's nothing there. Anybody been through a surgery we couldn't move? There's just nothing there. Just water. I'm, I'm sweating bullets because this is a big deal for me. Because I work hard. To stay active. And now what's going to happen? She said, Baron, you're going to be surprised at how quickly your muscle comes back. Fast forward a couple months and I, I'm, I'm noticing a shifting, a change. Not necessarily just in the knee, but the muscle around the knee. It's coming back with vengeance. I'm not doing any more on that leg than I'm doing on the other leg. But what is happening is surprising to me. So when I make the three-month appointment or four-month appointment, whatever it was, I, I begin to ask her questions. How in the world does it happen so rapidly? She said, here's what you need to understand. The time that's lapsed when you don't walk on it, you lose the muscle. But here's what she said. Study out muscle memory. And so I begin to study out. Anybody study out muscle memory? The common thought process of muscle memory is that muscle memory is based on the time that has been spent in repetition. So therefore, the time that I spent in repetition, your body memorizes that and your muscles are able to respond accordingly. So basically, it's, it, they're picking off, they're picking up where they left off. That's the concept of muscle memory. And so that, that was the common concept. 
She said, study it out. So when I begin to study it out, the, the, here's what they, they have figured out, is that muscle memory is not just time in repetition. Muscle memory is, is when you begin to push that muscle, whatever it is, uh, that muscle on the cellular level has the ability to be able to remember the action. So it's not just the repetition, it's built into the literal DNA of your body. So here's what she was saying to me. She made me study it out. She's the same one that does all the minor league surgeries there in Tulsa. We've got a bunch of minor league teams, and she does all the surgeries on them, and she's, she's phenomenal. She said, study it out. She knew I'd come up with the conclusion that there is some stuff down on the cellular level, but there has to be a recall of that. There has to be a recall of that. So when I get back into that place where I'm able to execute those basic uh, elements of working out, the body says at the cellular level, I remember that. I remember the time there. It's not just repetition. It's something deep down on the cellular level. I'm telling you, God has created some things down in the cellular level of mankind. I can prove it to you from the book of Genesis when the Bible says that God created male and female. The male word there in the Hebrew is zakar and that word means to remember. God placed some things deep down in the cellular level of our spirits that, 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 that he's trying to help us to recall. So here's what I felt when the Lord woke me up this morning. I, here's what I felt in the spirit. I felt like the Lord was saying, you tell my people today that I put some things down inside of them. And I know that there is a time frame right now. I know that weeping may endure, but I want them to remember who I am. I want them to remember my goodness. Remember my mercy. Remember my love. Remember my faithfulness. I want them to remember the times uh, where they were, they were at their lowest and I was there. I want them to re remember Amen. the times. It's the door between. And those are the moments where we stumble. Those are the moments where we falter. Those are the moments. But oh... For somebody who might have been at his lowest and he shook himself and says to himself, it is way better for me to be a servant in daddy's house than for me to dwell in the pen that I exist in at this time. I'm telling somebody he's calling us to remember. The beauty of the body, the beauty of the creation that God, when he pulled us together and he formed us and breathed into us, the beauty of it. At that cellular level, when I came back and I met her at my six months, she said, I can't tell the difference between one leg and the other. She said, are you working the, the right leg out anymore? I said, no, I'm not working out anymore. I'm doing whatever they tell me to do. She said, it's in the cellular level. I said, yeah, it's in the cellular level. She said, there's something beautiful about the, about the human body. I said, oh, it's, it's amazing. She said, Baron, did you realize that the body, literally, that when you work out your arms... When you work out your shoulders, your back, your chest, whatever, when you work out no matter what, uh, when you are in a state of trauma, when one area of the body is in a state of trauma, did you realize, Baron, that when you get back into the, in, into the flow of working out, uh, that the previous areas of the body automatically go and they start, uh, how did she put it? They start educating that area that's lacking to come back into its, its, its full prime. Here's what she was saying. You ready? She was saying there's healing elements in the body. They're already planted in the body. It's not necessary for us to look outside of the body. Everything that we need is already inside the body. I'm telling you right now, I felt it in the Holy Ghost this morning. Everything that you need is already inside this body. It's just time that we have to put back in. 
she told me the quicker you get back into the gym and doing what you were uh, were capable of doing get back into the gym you mean work out my arms work them out baron you mean work out my back work it out baron what is she what, what are you saying this morning preacher i'm saying get in, get back involved in the things of god get back involved in the thing Pastors talk about trading up. I'm telling you, I felt a witness in my spirit uh, about what he was saying. I'm telling you, there is health uh, in this church. Uh, We just got to get back into the body and start remembering those elements before the time. Joseph is able to look at his brothers and he's able to see them. And here's what he says to them. He says, don't you worry. I'm paraphrasing. Don't you worry. Don't you fear. Fear not. I'm not coming at you. The Lord knew the famine was coming. The Lord knew the famine was coming. And because he knew the famine was coming, he sent me on a journey. He sent me on a journey. But here's what he said. I love the fact that Joseph never reaches the first chair When he was forced out of his father's house, that was the only time he sat in that first chair. Daddy's favorite. The only time he occupied that first seat was in the house. And God said, I'm going to make everybody bow down to you, Joseph. You don't understand it. But if you can hold on, if you hold on, Joseph, to these principles, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm filled witness in the Holy Ghost. If you'll just stay true to yourself, Joseph, if you'll stay true and faithful to me. And Joseph, there was something about the dream. How do you know there was something about the dreams? Because the only time Joseph ever asked for anything was when he said, remember me. Remember me. What he was saying was, I've been faithful. Remember my faithfulness. Remember the fact that I've never deviated. It doesn't make a difference if I'm at the front door. It absolutely makes a difference that you're at the front. It doesn't make a difference if I'm painting a wall. It absolutely makes a difference if you're painting a wall. It's only the people that play instruments. No, I'm telling you, there is healing elements in the body. So if you're a prayer warrior, pray. If you're a greeter, greet. If you're a cleaner, clean. If you're a worshiper, worship. There is healing in this body. We're looking to the outside. I'm telling you, there's healing in this body. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. There's healing in this body. Every time you serve, every time you remain faithful, Joseph, I'm telling you, he was doing things down that prison that would have not been appreciated on our work schedule and workloads. What he was responsible of doing down in that prison would not have been clean, nice, or pleasant. Uh, But Joseph, every time he scooped, uh, every time he remained faithful, every time he said, yes, sir, every time he said, uh, he said, I'll do whatever you need me to do, even though it was unfair. I'm innocent. Regardless, it's just not time yet, Joseph. And the way I'm going to get you there. No Hebrew would have ever been able to sit in the chair that Joseph sat in, except for it would have been orchestrated by God. It doesn't make sense how or why this happened or is happening. I'm telling you right now, he takes, uh, he takes the proposition of, of, uh, of Potiphar's wife and he uses a proposition from, from that position and he, and he forces Joseph in the next position to get him before Pharaoh. Do not question God's perspectives and motives and plans. Stay true to the judgment of God. It's not the judgments we fail in. It's the time that we fail in. And I'm telling you, we're on the cusp of things. God is pouring things out in a way that he's never poured it out into any generation before. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've been a part of it with my own eyes. I was in... I was in uh, El Salvador in, in November. I've never been a part of a crusade before. That's just, uh, just not crusade type. Put me in a form of leadership. Put me in the form where I can serve. Carry some bag. But, but crusade type, it's just not, not, not the things I've ever thought of, I, w- I would be doing overseas. Never have in 25 years of ministry. But I felt like the Lord saying, I need you to go. I need you to go. I need you to go. So I went. And when I went, I'm telling you, I stood. There was 4,000 people in a stadium. It was hot. Brutally hot. 
And when they, when they gave the altar call, I saw people running. You talk about the all of God, Brother Miller. I literally saw them running to the front, carrying their children, wanting to be the first ones up in front of the, uh, in front of the stage there, the platform area. I saw them running, sweating and running to the front. Uh, and the call was given. The Holy Ghost, I'm telling the Holy Ghost was poured out like that. You couldn't even get to somebody. How do you know they spoke Spanish? You know when they're not speaking Spanish. You see the countenance change on their face. I couldn't communicate with them, but I'm telling you, you see it. You saw it. But it, I've seen mass people get the Holy Ghost before. What I haven't seen is this. I haven't seen children brought up to the front that were literally crippled. Little fingers and, and hands and, and crippled and mothers uh, with, with protruding cancers on their bodies. Uh, I've never seen it before. I've never seen that type of healing before. And I watched as people begin to pray and hands begin to flip into... I'm, I'm t- I saw it with these own eyes right here. I'm standing right here at this side of the altar when a young girl about 16 years old... I took pictures. Pop, 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 pop. I'm taking pictures as fast as my little thumbs would work. Boom, 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 boom. She comes up to the front... She's crying. We have an interpreter there. He says, what can we pray for you about? And she said, I have a cancerous tumor on my neck. And when she lifted up her throat, you could see the bulge. It was probably half the size of a grapefruit right here. She lifted her face up towards the heaven. You could see it. And she's weeping. It's a cancerous tumor on her throat. And we laid our hands on her. And when we let go, she put her head up to the heavens, and that tumor was right there. There was a, a, just a, just a, 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 just saturated with, with, with doubt immediately. And I saw this kid, he's not even really a, I mean, he's a he, he, he preaches, but he's not, you know. But, but, but he went in, he said, we're going to pray again. He said, Jesus prayed twice. He said, a man saw men as trees. That's, this, this is that moment. And he threw his hand right on top of her head. I'm telling you, he pushed her head back. Her head went back. And that tumor was there. And when the name of Jesus was invoked over her body, I, with my own eyes, saw a cancer just literally suck into her body. It was gone immediately. I saw it with his own. I'm telling you. The Lord is willing and able in this last hour to do things that we can't even comprehend. It makes sense to me that a Joseph type would stand over Egypt and begin. It makes sense to me that that God would say, I want a Hebrew there. I've got a bigger plan. This is not just about Joseph. It's not just about his immediate family. I'm pulling a nation there. And from there, I'm pushing them into promise. Everything happens over time. How many times have I grown too weary? Misery greatly upon me. God's willing to do things in this last hour. Come on, he's got to have a people that are willing to say, today is the day of salvation. I'm not saying things change today. I'm saying I'm going to remain faithful Today, I'm not saying everything comes together today. I'm going to say I'm going to remain faithful today. Joseph's only cry in prison in Potiphar's house uh, ever since the pit. His only recorded cry was remember me. And when it was the right time, the remembrance came. And when it came and the king was disturbed, somebody looks down and says, Oh king, oh king, when I was in... There was a man who told us both everything that would happen. Bring that man before me. And they brought him before Pharaoh. And let me tell you, ready? Let me tell you the way Joseph told his brothers. Here's what he said. He said these words. God sent me. And he sums it up by saying, and God has made me a father to Pharaoh. He's made me a father to Pharaoh. I'm telling you, nowhere, nowhere Joseph sits in that first chair. He'll never be Pharaoh. He'll never be Pharaoh. This is always Pharaoh's throne. And Joseph will never be Pharaoh. But what he can be 
and only God can work this kind of thing out, is to be a father to Pharaoh, to be a counsel to Pharaoh, to be, to be, be the voice to Pharaoh. I'm telling you, that's the way that God will work. When he gives a promise, ladies and gentlemen, when he determines a judgment, no matter what, what? When God determines a judgment, it is simply a matter of time until yeah. the judgment happens. Yeah. If there has been a promised revival, I'm yeah. telling you, it is just a matter of time until yeah. revival unfolds. If he has told you that your child is coming back, I'm telling you, it is just a matter of time until your child comes He promised me healing. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you get up in the morning. Yeah, but you don't understand the prison that I'm in. Make the best of that cell, baby. I'm telling you, make the best of that situation. Because, you ready? No prison, no prison can ever shut the door. No prison can hold Joseph from being a father to Pharaoh. It's just a matter of time. It's just time. I'm going to close at the piano. It's just a matter of time. Jesus steps onto the scene, and Mary approaches him, and Mary says, They're running out of wine. They're running out. And Jesus looks at her, and it's not an irreverent word, but it's not a term of endearment. He says, woman. I know what would happen in my head if I would have said woman to my mama. I would not be standing before you today. Time would have been taken from me and he says woman my time is not yet come it's not un- uh, it's it's not time yet if you read john chapter 2 you read through verse 1 through verse 11 i believe there is a central theme throughout that passage of scripture it's the first recorded miracle of jesus christ Is there significance? Absolutely. All throughout. I'm not here to prove significance. The Bible talks about it's on the third day. There you go. Most weddings, they try to make it on a Tuesday because there was a double blessing on a Tuesday. There's just so much significance in that passage of Scripture. Here's here's what you find throughout the entirety of that passage of Scripture. Jesus says, my time, my time is not yet come. And she looks over and at the servants and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. She is, she is not, she is not affected. Mom is not affected by the way that Jesus said it or what he said. She simply looks and says, whatever he says, you do it. Because whatever he deems right will be right. And her time is done. She walks away. The Bible records that Jesus looks at the servants and he says, here's what he says, fill the water pots with water and then serve to the governor of the feast, the ruler of the feast. between the pouring of the water the ladling of the water or the pouring in to of the water the chemical makeup changes water into wine it's the first miracle it's a beautiful miracle brother Miller but you ready water's always turned into Hot enough. Come 
comes up, forms clouds. Clouds get too heavy, water comes down. When water comes down, it waters the seed. And over time, the seed grows. When the seed grows, it takes time, but they pick the seeds, which now is a fruit, because over time it grows. And then they pick the fruit and they take the time to press it. And they walk and they take their time and they press it. And the juices are collected and they're stored into skins. And they are stored into cooler places. And then they allow time. And over the course of time, what once fell down upon the earth, now, now, over time, is ready to be served. The fermentation process happens, and a lot of time has taken place. Some years, some decades, some centuries. Time. Jesus arrives on the scene, and he simply says, my time. moment that this happens, the clock starts. The moment of miracle, the clock starts. A time's not yet come. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Fill the water pots. Calvary's calling. Calvary's calling. Jesus only has three and a half years to get to Calvary. It's a short amount of time. The miracle of water and the wine has always happened. Just at this point, there's no time. I felt the Holy Ghost speak to me this morning and tell me, you tell the church, I'll step out of time. You hear what I just said? I was so disturbed. 4.30 this morning, I got out of bed frustrated because I was tired. And I sat down and I said, Jesus, what do you want? What do you need? He said, you tell him I'll step out of time. Judgment has been passed. For some of you, it's been a long, long time. For the church, maybe it's been a long, long time. But guess what? Healing. The miraculous. God is willing to say what, what, what I was going to do over time. I will pull it back to this very moment. What I would have allowed for the fermentation process. I'm willing to step out of time. For this. For my people. For this moment. I'm telling you time is ticking away. We know it. We feel it walk out you understand we are very very close uh, at this at the, the con conclusion of everything and God is saying I am willing to step out of time because there is no time and this time it's not Calvary that's calling it's not Calvary that's calling oh no that time has already passed uh, what this moment is calling for is a time where there will be no says, why did you save the best for last? You know what he was really saying? You've, you've switched the order of things. It's not the best. It's normally this is what served first. So what you did is you switched the time that it served. I'm telling you right now. Some of us are going to be able to leave the service today saying, you saved the best for now. Oh, I didn't understand how you could do it, but you saved the best for now. Oh, I wish somebody would throw their hands in the air with faith. Come on, throw your hands in the air with faith and believe.
gather around the front, you may. If you'd like to just pray where you're at, you're welcome to do it the same. But I wonder if we find that place of all right now that Pastor Miller was talking about, that place where we, we approach him the way that Isaiah saw him out of time. He saw him in a, in a state of the present I am. And when he did, he said, oh, oh. situation what would happen today oh god oh god oh god oh, we're healing in this body there's something that exists here today it's already here it's already here it's already in this body it's already in this body i hesitated to say anything because i've been at length today but i just felt it so strong in the spirit i'll turn this over to pastor miller opened up with a simple quote about the awkwardness of a, a dysfunctional caterpillar transformation we would call that the metaphor, metamorphosis phase, it just takes time you know that there are four phases of a caterpillar to turn into a, a butterfly we realize that not all do but those that do go through these four phases it takes time there's a consumption phase in which they just have to consume and consume and consume and they consume and then they outgrow themselves they consume outgrow themselves it would seem selfish it would except for the fact that there is such a necessity to consume i won't preach that but it's good preaching material following that consumption phase is a cocoon phase and that is what we all understand they had to hide themselves. It's where they're most vulnerable. They're unprotected. Times and seasons where it's just like that. Very dark. Not a lot of light. Vulnerability. They try their best to put themselves into a position where they can remain there in safety. But no matter what, they're still subject to the elements. Subject to others. And it just is what it is. It's difficult because God doesn't always back and protect. Sometimes it's vulnerable. But oh, you're trading up. What a statement. The third phase is an interesting phase and it's called the condensed phase. In this stage, you've probably seen it, read about it. In this stage, the caterpillar literally is broken down by these enzymes in its body. Every part of of that caterpillar is broken down and if you were to open up the cocoon at that stage or phase there would be nothing that would emerge but ooze and you would think that something that was in a solid state if it was turned into a liquid form there's no way that it would emerge as something as beautiful as a butterfly but sure enough it does the enzymes, you ready? Break down every part of the caterpillar. Everything is digested, everything, except for what are called imaginal discs. And these imaginal discs are literally within the cellular level of the caterpillar the moment that it is born. What is in these imaginal discs? Every single part of the butterfly exists within these discs. When the caterpillar is born, the butterfly is already there. It's already there. It doesn't transform into something that it's not. It just has to lose everything that doesn't belong to the butterfly. That's it. So what the Lord does is he grows it to the point. Now it can be digested or digestible. And it breaks down into a liquid form. And every single part of the caterpillar is broken down except for the imaginal discs. So the question is, is why don't the imaginal discs emerge sooner? 
The answer is found in the boy Joseph who in his juvenile state said, you'll bow down to me, you'll bow down to me, you'll bow down to me, you'll bow down to me. Mom, dad, you'll bow down to me. The promise is there. Just the the know-how, the time, the man, Joseph. The promise was there. God put that into the fiber of Joseph. He just had to lose everything that was not who Joseph was supposed to be and that took time. Do you know what holds back the imaginal discs from happening earlier? It's called a juvenile hormone. That's what it's called. I've got some of those that haven't haven't quite condensed down yet. But it's holding back. It's holding back in place, the butterfly. But oh, there's a time that the creative phase happens and the imaginal disc begin to break forth and the caterpillar begins to grow and he punctures through. And that forcing through that rough, tough exterior pushes those muscles, those fibers, to a place that he's now able to execute. I don't know how they, and I don't know who they are, but there are they's out there. You know who they are. They say this, they said that. But there is stated in science that there is an understanding how, I don't know, they figured this out. But they figured out that a butterfly will remember when it was a caterpillar. And oftentimes it stays around the same areas in which it was birthed. It now takes flight into what it was purposed to be. It just took a little bit of time. What would happen if we would have the type of faith that a Gentile woman had when she said, my daughter is sick. It's not your time yet. That's what it was. It's not your time yet. Should I give the bread that belongs to the children, the meat that belongs to them, to the, to the dogs? What he was saying was, is it's not the Gentiles' time yet. And she said, yay, Lord. But still yet the dogs, they'll lick up some crumbs from the master's table. What would happen if Jesus would step out of time for you? What kind of faith... What what kind of persistence? I wonder if we would just allow the processes of all that juvenile thinking to just begin to to be consumed up and allow the promises of His Word to come forth and spring forth in our life. So before and when you leave today, leave with an assurance that faith, I'm telling this congregation today, that faith can produce things that nothing else can produce. Leprosy kills over time. Everything in the word of the Lord, Jesus just executed it. Quick, 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 quick. What would happen if a congregation said, I know it might not, it shouldn't have, it probably, but I'm not going to, it's not going to stop me from asking, from pursuing. It's not going to stop me from getting myself into a position. I'm not talking about being selfish. I'm talking about saying, Lord, you can because you have and they're no more special than I am 12 years is a long time to deal with something she should not have but she stepped out of the time frame of that disease and said I'm done I'm done with it when she heard of Jesus she pursued touched the hem of his garment and there what would happen what would happen oh what would be the memories of a church that looked down and said I once was but I am no longer would you lift your hands right now, Brother Miller? I, 
turn it over to you. Why don't we lift our hands right now with faith believing Jesus. Lord, I pray that there would be a, just an immense amount of faith uh, that would increase in this congregation. Every elder in this place, uh, every, every married in this place, every single in this place, every student in this house right now, no matter of degree or pedigree or history, God, I pray right now that there would be a downloading of supernatural faith uh, that would literally be transmitted into this congregation and they would pursue the God who was able to do exceeding abundantly above all. We ask these things in the great name of Jesus. Would you clap your hands to the King of Glory? You've been listening to the Living Faith Everett podcast series. Tune in next week for the next part of the series, or join us online at livingfaithministries.church. Flows in the Holy Ghost.